My name is Basil Shikhan. I'm VP of Engineering at AppLoving, and you know, we're gonna talk about how to write code that others won't hate. Now, this is a huge subject. There's tons of things that you could do, there's tons of things that you can debate upon, there's tons of things that everyone's gonna disagree upon, so I'm gonna cover a subsection that I found practical and I found useful in my five-year tenure, uh, tenure at AppLoving as we were building the system. So this is by no means a comprehensive review. There's a few things that struck my heart that I try to teach to the newer AppLoving employees and that I wanted to share. So at AppLoving, during the last five years, we built a pretty big system. So we're an ad network, so we serve ads. We try to keep the uh, applications free, so we process tons of requests a day, we push to production every day, so we have a team of like 22 engineers handling all that stuff, so this requires tremendous code discipline. So pretty much to be able to be agile and to be able to scale sort of this big with this smaller team, your code has to be pretty, pretty, pretty good because you can't just afford, you know, get into a giant refactoring, break everything and the entire network goes down, and everything's terrible, and that's exactly what I'm gonna to talk to you about. So, this happened uh, some time ago. So, it was a Sunday afternoon, just like this one, right? And my phone rang, and I looked at the dialer, and it, I really didn't like what I see, it was our CEO. And, yeah, so, uh, basically, our system was massively delayed. Now, in the world of advertising, delays are horrible, right? Everything has to be real time. We strive for 100 millisecond latency. So, far hour delay in stats is, yeah, that's pretty, pretty bad. So, of course, I stopped doing whatever I was doing. I pulled out my laptop. Now, I'm a developer, right? So, the first thing I do, I pull up, I update from Git, and I look at the kind of component that was massively delayed. I wasn't super familiar with the code, so I was like, okay, I'm gonna read the code, I'm gonna figure out what's going on, fix it, and you know, resume to my barbecuing practice. So, opened up the code, couldn't quite make sense of what's going on. Now, luckily the code had tons of comments. Really liked that, and I was like, okay, that's gonna be a breeze. Yeah, not so much. Most of the comments were, okay, run a loop. All right, cool. Yeah, I, I can see that, or, you know, call function now. All right, awesome. So, right then and there, I figured, as an engineer, I'm sure that other people are gonna love me if my comments actually document why I'm doing something instead of what exactly I'm doing. Also, you know, if I'm, now when I write some code, I'm trying to write a comment, and I can't quite put in words what I'm trying to do, that really makes me think, well, do I really wanna do that? Is that architected correctly? How's it gonna read when someone on Sunday in the middle of a barbecuing activity reads through that code? Or is he gonna be able to comprom um, comprehend that comment? So that's the, lesson, that's the lesson that I learned immediately. But not to worry. Okay, so we don't have time for reading code. This thing is on fire, we gotta figure it out. Okay, I decided I'm gonna be super smart. So last weekend, during my barbecue session, I didn't get a call from a CEO and this weekend I did. Therefore, something has changed. Well, we have GitHub for changes, so what I can do is I can look at the GitHub log and figure out what exactly has changed, and this will give me a clue as to what has started the slowing down the system. Not so much. So this is the commit log from that component. Continued development, continued development, misspelled continued development, and a couple more. Okay, that is not so helpful. Fine. So right then and there, I learned that developers will love me if I l write good commit messages. What am I changing? And what components could be affected by this change? Of course, if that code had the better commit messages, I wouldn't have been figured out, I wouldn't have been able to figure out what is exactly the commit that has broke or that has created this bad behavior. So at that point, I knew I'd have to roll up my sleeves, and get down to reading the code. Now, reading someone else's code is, I don't know, many of you have tried that, and it's always a chore. And it's, you know that some people write better code, some people write worse code. It took me a while to find the culprit, and when I found it, it was a really odd named method. It was something about like that. 
find object now. And you know, when I when I looked at it, I used a combination of log lines and uh, from the logs and just general knowledge to figure out that this could be causing the slowdown. Of course, I had to question myself. So, what's going on here? Is it like from this method name? Can you figure out like if it's slow? Is it a is it a concurrency issue? Um, you know, is there some memory that's you know uh, being shared with some log that's being acquired by someone else? Is it a DB problem? Is this method trying to go to a DB and like fetch something and it's slow? Is it a networking issue? Maybe it's trying to go to some other component, make a call, get a response, and that's slow. So nomenclature, I think, is extremely important in software engineering, definitely important in what we do. So then I learned that developers would love me if I keep my names consistent. And from that day, I decided, you know, I'm going to keep this nomenclature. Not that it's an authoritative way of nomenclature. It's just as long as you're consistent within your project, I think you're pretty good. So I use get and set. Of course, depending on the language. Some language don't like prefix with get. If it's an in-memory lookup, retrieve or save. If it's a DB lookup, and fetch a post to indicate that this is some sort of an I.O. operation to a remote server. Now, if the developer used this nomenclature, that would have been a lot easier to pinpoint the issue and to say exactly what's going on. Instead, I had to read through the code of every method to figure out what exactly it does. So, final edit. And, you know, it felt very, very good. I pinpointed the problem. Okay, so it was a slow database read. Luckily, we have a very competent operations team, so those guys are great. So I picked up my phone. I knew that there was a spare database somewhere, and probably we can balance the load, and it'll just fix the problem for now. So I called up operations, and I said, hey, you know what? Like This component, it's pointing to this older database. Can you guys just update it for now so it points to a faster and better version? And, and then on Monday, we'll figure out the details and fix it. And naturally, the answer was, no, 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 we can't, we can't do that. Why? Well, everything was hard-coded. Every single database connection, every address, every password, every, and this is, I couldn't actually show you the file that, was, that had hard-coded because it has a whole bunch of information about our infrastructure. So I just pulled the general stock. So everything was hard-coded in that file. So basically, there was no way for the operations team to make any changes at all without our involvement, without developers' involvement, without a code push. And right then and there, I learned that, you know, ops would love you if you'd write, if you put your configuration into a properties file, if your database names, ports, timeouts, number of cores, if, you know, your number of threads, if you're into that sort of thing, right? Uh, if they are located somewhere conveniently in an uh, overall properties file. I'll take that point one step further. For some critical code paths, you could actually enable or disable these paths through a property. So for example, if you're shipping this super dangerous feature and you're shipping it you know, around 4 or 5 p.m.-ish on Friday, you know, maybe you know, you'd put some sort of a NIF statement around that feature, and unless it's you know, super critical, you know, if something goes terribly wrong in the weekend, you can just ask your, you know, friendly operations guy, oh yeah, just, just flip that flag to off and we'll forget about the feature until Monday and then we'll, you know, deal with it in a proper way. So properties file, properties files are truly your friends. So, you know, of course, to resolve that problem, we made a code push, updated the config, and the issue was resolved. And, of course, on Monday, we did a post-mortem. Now, post-mortems, are fun, right? Because you kind of analyze, okay, so what went wrong and how can you fix it? How can you never run into that problem ever again? So you know, the first question, of course, in a postmortem was to our operations team. So we have a super smart logging system, right? So all the logs, they go to the central server, right? So on the central server, when you develop a new component, you can pretty much tell operations, oh yeah, I have this new component called add processor. Like, can you do your magic to set up logging and log monitoring and all that so that if the component starts, for example, erroring out too much, an email would notify ops or you that something's wrong. That makes total sense, right? So we looked at the process. Of course, when that component was called that processor, when it was created, ops team was notified. They ran their recipe to set up that log monitoring. 
except for there's a bit of a problem with that component, really. So the GitHub name was Applying Add Processor. The log tag that it used was Add Processor, all lowercase. The name of the executable was Add Dash Processor. Now, the log file where it persisted logs into was processing-adds.log. So that completely broke any sort of automation that our operations team had, right? Because it was uh, writing into a log file that was not consistently naming, named with anything else. So even though they ran the script that had some expectations as to what the service is structured, uh, since this particular service was not structured in a standard way, that completely missed, their uh, operations monitoring system completely missed any errors that were logged by this service. So a way to make operations team love you is be consistent. You know, the project name, the, all the executable names, the log tags, the uh, property names, the log file names. If you have these consistent across your projects, it will make it super easy for anyone working on monitoring or automating deployment, automate your system. And you can scale really fast with that because instead of making some custom work for every single component, you know, your operations team can just automate one process assuming the naming is consistent. So that was fine. Luckily, you know, as any error-prone system, we have multiple levels of redundancy and monitoring, right? Because, you know, you can't have one level of monitoring because if that fails, what happens? So we have this other super smart level of monitoring. Every service exposes an endpoint, and that's basically a help endpoint, and the idea is that if the service is down, you call the help endpoint, it doesn't return you anything, and again, an email or an alert goes out, and, you know, alarm is raised. So why did that not happen? So I looked at the help endpoint for that service. It was implemented. And it didn't really return a very good response. And of course, this was a hard-coded response from the service. So as you can imagine, the service was super busy. It was actually super slow and basically not functional. However, since response from the health service was hard-coded, from the outside, it looked as if everything is A-OK. -okay. So this was the time when I learned the importance of good health endpoints. So instead of just returning a hard-coded response, well, run some basic check, connect to the database. Maybe in your health servers, run one loop of processing on some task data. Also, what about exposing some extra stats for uh, the operations team? Maybe some sort of a status, or maybe number of some fatal errors that you've seen, so that they can automate uh, your, again, they can automate the monitoring of it. As an icing on the cake, when we're working on other components, we found that it's actually beneficial to have two health endpoints. One that exposes all this super internal information for the purposes of internal monitoring tools, and then another, a very basic endpoint that you can also expose that does pretty much the same thing, it runs the same check, but doesn't expose all your private company details, so you can back up your internal monitoring with some external tool, you know, like Pingdom or like, that you can use, you can point them to this public endpoint that doesn't expose any of your internal stuff, it just kind of tells, is the service is up? Again, it's critical that you, uh, inside the service, that you actually run through the basic processing code to make sure that uh, health actually uh, represents the state of your system. So, at this point, we were pretty satisfied, right? So, we identified the problem. We identified the few issues why the problem was not caught on time. And, you know, we, I kind of, you know, from that, our, uh, our post-mortem has concluded at that point, and everyone was pretty happy about it and would fix the problems, but I kind of asked myself a bigger question. You know, that service, you know, it took me a while to figure out what exactly is going on in that code. You know, is that service perhaps not architected correctly? Like, why was the code so complicated? Why, you know, did it break in the first place? Maybe, you know, the requirements from the business side were not adequate, <laughs> you know? How do you develop something that, um, you know, is able to move fast enough without breaking and adjust to sort of the changing demands of, you know, the business, of the real world? 
Right, because I mean, and this is probably the most controversial point of this uh, little speech, because you know, everything before is kind of a no-brainer for a bigger system, right? You kind of, we know how to write good code in the importance of comments. We know how to make the operations team happy. This is something I'm going a little bit out on a limb, but uh, you know, bear with me. So, you know, one of the things that happened to that service I think that the developers started it with very good intentions, right? With very good intentions of building something, you know, the right way. And at the end of the day, it ended up being, you know, kind of a bit of a mess of an architecture. And for that particular case, I learned that, you know, one of the reasons why it became a mess is because of the business requirements, right? They changed, it was a service with a lot of uh, business logic, right? So it was doing some processing. so. You know how it starts, right? It starts with a very clean kind of, oh yeah, yeah, and super simple. You know, you get a request and you do some processing and you spit a response. And then in a couple of months, it's like, yeah, yeah, but you know what? This, this one client, and they're like super big, and for them, we're gonna do something a little different, right? And, and you put a hack in there, and maybe if you have your common processing interface, you know, you add a new parameter to indicate whether you should do this custom processing or not. And then, of course, a few months later, you get this other client that is, you know, almost like that other one, but it's, again, just a slightly bit different, and it's a huge business opportunity, so we really got to implement it this way. So, you know, of course, in your common processing method, in your method to start processing, you add one more parameter, right? And that other parameter is, uh, you know, should you do this other custom processing? So that is, uh, I think that's a common way that a lot of services are failing. So this sort of brings me to another point of sort of code duplication and points of it. And this is where I'm saying going on a limb. So on majority of speeches and on majority of books that you read, code duplication is marked as a completely evil thing. And I think that there's a little more to that. So basically, when you think about the systems that you design, when I think about the systems that I design, some systems are some sort of a system level or core level uh, products, and others are sort of on the other side. They're very close to the user. They're very close to the business side. They're very close to the actual data processing, maybe interfacing with the user, interfacing with some other system. And what I found is on the system feature, you know, for example, you're abstracting a file system or you're abstracting uh, some sort of a threading model, it's very nice and it's very beneficial not to have any code duplication, to have nice abstractions, to have design patterns, to have all that good stuff serve you to make the code and to make that abstraction very, very clean and easy to use. And it abstracts it great because since you're dealing with a core level system, you're dealing with a sort of a man-made construct which is already pretty abstract. Right, so for example, if you're building like your core queuing system, you know, that system is abstract by nature, right? You have a queue topic, gets a message, reads a message back, it's very easy to write interface. It's very easy to avoid any sort of duplication. However, when you are on the other side of this equation, when you're building a user interface, or when you're building some sort of an API, outward facing API service, what I found is as you grow a system from sort of day one to year one, year two, year five, there is a feature blow. It's, it's inherent because when you deal with people, when you deal with clients, there are requirements that come in and it's not that requirements are bad, it's inevitable, right? You know, I mean, just think about like dealing with dates, right? It's a human made disaster for engineers. Dates are horrible, right? Um, so what I found, and again, to, pro to make the iteration faster and to prevent this sort of bloat of leaking abstraction on a, some very nice and shiny abstract interface, if you introduce a little bit of code duplication, if you, you, of course, you pay the cost of if you need to change it, you need to change it everywhere, but the benefit is if, you know, your, every, your different UI page has some of the same code, when you change that code, actually the rest of the system is a little more stable. You don't have to touch the overall abstraction for this one page that has to change. So, this is one thing I learned, and you know, kind of as I started practicing it, what I tried to do is the closer I get to the user interface, the more I allow myself do some things that are you know, code duplication, that are 
basically not as clean as not as clean as a guide that I would follow when I work on some very high level system level feature. So what that allows me to do is, of course, as new requirements come in, basically the system features, the high level services, your message bus or your abstraction for I.O., that really remains intact, right? And all that changes are these sort of nodes of your big system that are very specific to perform, to render a page or to perform some sort of an API request. So that is probably the most controversial point. However, this used to a certain degree allowed us building, system that, building systems that are able to respond to a fast changing uh, business side changes without having too much impact on an overall system. So, you know, after this experience and after a number of other experiences at AppLoving, I sort of, uh, you know, learned that, of course, there's a lot of things that you can do for other people not to hate you. But I definitely started writing better comments. I started putting down commit messages that make a lot of sense. I try to keep the variable naming as consistent as possible. Most of the constants were moved out to properties files. The naming of all the projects, we made sure that it is consistent through the log name, through the properties file name, through the GitHub name. The, uh, um, yeah, the help endpoints were standardized and exposed tons of uh, information. And of course, we try to be more conscious about the architecture and the design of our systems. So, you know, after having done that, I'm able to roll up my sleeves and have the barbecue or do a conference. <laughs> so that's a bit of a short talk. So have time for some questions and early lunch. The downside. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, so the downside is for not reading yourself is very, very easy. So let's say you have a login page, right? So you create some class that represents a user login page, right? So then uh, someone tells you, okay, you know what? For this one company, this login page, it has to look exactly like your, our common login page, but it has to have one more field, right? So that you have a choice, you either modify the overall login page code, right? You have your global login page and you add an if statement, if client equals, you know, Google, then add this new field. That's one choice. Another choice you have, you can use inheritance. You can have login page, you can have, you know, your Google login page that extends from the login page that can uh, extend into more issues down the line. Or you can basically say, you know what, I'm gonna copy paste the login page for Google and it's gonna be a completely separate thing for Google. Right? So if you follow the first route, where you keep everything in one sort of general page, as more requirements grow, then you have you know, a login page. Then you have like a question, you know, a login page has the same box, but it does something slightly different. Do you extend it from the Google login page? Do you extend it from the common login page? Do you add that code to the global login page? So that is a bit of a downside. So basically, what you're dealing with, you're trying to create an abstraction. And the closer you get to the user, the more that abstraction is gonna be broken with some weird concrete feature that is specific in like 10% of cases. So I didn't know that sort of answers the question, but uh, does it? Yeah, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, so if you change option two, again, it's, it depends on the project. Then usually what happens is as you have, then you have a new requirement, right, you have I don't know, Microsoft join, and they're like, okay, you know what, Microsoft is exactly like Google, so copy their logic by hand, and then, you know what, add this one feature. So you can sort of extend from that, and then you can get into weird state where you have login page, Google that extends login page, uh, Microsoft that extends login page. Again, this is not a common guideline. I guess this is just one of the things to think about, you know, to see if this duplication could reduce the complexity of your system. All right, any? Mm 
Well, uh, my, I, my choice would be definitely to rename the variable. So here's the reason why. So I'm a big proponent of IDEs. I, I, I know that IDEs, like, there's a lot of pros and cons and, like, you know, to use an IDE, but renaming is actually one of the best things on a structured language that IDE could do. Because if you're using an, uh, loosely, like, a JavaScript or a Ruby kind of deal, then I would probably be a little more hesitant about renaming every single variable if you're using, you know, C, C++, Java, Scala, or something that where a structure could be made, and IDEs are great at renaming. That's one of the cheapest operations that it can do, Objective-C, uh, it can do, and you can just renaming, rename things back and forth without the cost. So I guess in your case, it really depends on the language and on the tooling that you're using. So my preference would be to rename it, but of course, if you have an unstructured language, the downside of renaming, of course, is a lot better because, you know, string find and replace would not obviously cut it. So. Uh, how have you been able to, if, 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 if in fact you did, how have you been able to propagate some of these lessons that you've learned in your code? Yeah, so that's actually a really good question. So what we have is we have a code review system. And code reviews were great. So basically in JIT, they have a great feature where you can lock a branch so that uh, no one can actually merge into a given branch and the branch that you lock is master. So this basically forces all engineers to create a pull request, and then you have a people who can merge, so these are usually the team leads, you know, to whom you sort of give these insights first, right? And they do the code review, and they kind of look at how the code is structured, and the general guideline is that every line of code is reviewed at least by two different people. Now, we don't enforce it, like, automatically, it's more of a, a convention, but at least one committer, one maintainer, has to merge it, so at least one person isn't forced to review it. So that is the main, the main goal. So that's one way to do it. Another way to do it, and the second way to do it is pretty sneaky, I think. Um, well, but it is what it is. So as a group of engineering, I wrote a lot of initial components, so what I do is once in a while I pick a project, a small project in just random pieces of the system, and I try to implement it to make sure that that piece of the system is okay. So if I have a project that should take, you know, about a day, right, and I go in open the code and it's, you know, complete mess and I can't really implement that simple feature, I know that something on one of these levels is wrong. So this gives me a way first to make sure that I know how the code works and sort of have the connection to the system, but also it's a great way, you know, one thing is to code review the thing, right, but another way is to actually implement something on that code base. So this gives me an opportunity to make sure that no component actually runs away too quickly. And of course, I encourage others to do it. So that's sort of the second, it's a more sneaky way to make sure that these guidelines are somewhat adhered to. So does it kind of make sense? Absolutely. All right, cool. Any other questions? No? All right, well, early lunch, very good. Thank you very much.